The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right. I, I promise I didn't choose that song. I, I swear. Um, welcome to the Stoa, everyone. I'm Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. And the Stoa is a place for us to go here and dialogue about what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. And this is a second uh, part of a series we're having here at the Stoa called Stealing the Culture with Dialogos. Um, and the theme of today is female rivalry. Uh, so I'll explain how, uh, what will what the form format will be in a moment, uh, but the the guests are going to be Raven Connolly, uh, Tan or Tarn Rogers uh, Johns, uh, maybe Gray, and Ayla. Uh, and if actually everyone can just turn off their video except uh, the guests today, because uh, that will help the recording. Um, so how today is going to work is uh, I will take in Raven in a moment, and then Raven is going to. Uh, do initial prompt, uh, initial provocation, uh, and then uh, she'll stop and invite uh, anyone else who feels called amongst the three other guests to speak. And then, you know, they'll speak and the stop and the next person speaks, the next person speaks. And it's an organic free associative conversation for about an hour. Uh, maybe the only rough guideline is share the conversational airspace if you feel like someone hasn't been uh, speaking for a bit. Uh, so that will go for roughly 60 minutes. And then after that, uh, Raven will take me back in and then we'll have a Q&A. So anytime throughout this uh, Dialogo, so just write your questions in the chat um, and I'll call on you and unmute yourself, ask your question to the, the panel and then we can go from there. We're here for 90 minutes in total. Um, so if you just arrived, let's turn off your, your video and I'll turn off mine in a moment. Uh, that being said, I think I covered any, everything. So Raven, you are up take you in. Thanks, Peter. And thanks, everybody for coming today. I'm really I've been excited for this conversation. Female rivalry has been something that's been on the back of my mind thinking about just human relationships and tension and conflict. And there's a lot that I seem that I feel like I know about male rivalry and how men engage in conflict with one another. And I realized through kind of examining my own experience and thinking about the things I know about women that I didn't really understand the dynamics as well. I also noticed that I don't have that many female friends. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, I wonder if um, I actually feel threatened by other women. Uh, and then that kind of started a spiral of examination, um, going into the literature, into research, and looking at the clusters of behaviors that women seem to engage with uh, when they are in rivalry with one another. I also have been, you know, actively in like the polyamory community and there's a lot of work around tinkering with feelings of tension and rivalry in the sexual dynamics. And so I thought that that would also be an interesting path for us to go down in a conversation today to think about both the sexual dynamics where rivalry can become much more clear because clearly threatening feelings around emotional bonds, but then there's also collaboration and, and work. So there's a bunch of different domains in which women are interacting with each other that this, this quality of rivalry may come up. And some of the things that I looked at when uh, I was doing research were the qualities that came up, uh, ambition being one of them. Women who are more ambitious tend to engage in more of these rivalrous behaviors makes sense intuitively, but it's something that, you know, examining oneself being like, oh, I mean, I, I do have this drive, this, uh, this kind of sense of ambition inside of myself. And so I identified with that immediately as, a, as, a, as my own personal quality. And I thought that all of the women here as well would be women who want to attain things, who are trying to succeed in the world and be independent and motivated. And that kind of ambition might lead us all to have these experiences of either being in rivalry with other women or um, engaging in rivalrous uh, in, in interactions ourselves. There's also this feeling of being threatened. You know, your opportunities or the things that you want or another woman wants being threatened uh, by your presence or by her presence, right? These things kind of go in both, can go in both directions. And what it is to feel threatened, what, what is that like? 
and what kind of shadow that brings up. What are you motivated to do when you're experiencing that sensation, particularly when you're so driven to get the thing that you want? There's also a component of this that's about beauty and women being around other women who are beautiful, more beautiful than them, uh, the things that you notice, the baby behaviors uh, that they end up receiving from other people um, and that kind of currency of, of beauty and how that ends up being part of this dynamic of rivalry with women, both in terms of sexual relationships, but also in the workplace, also in collaboration and also in friendships. There's also a issue of morality policing, gossip. So there's this uh, tension or this tendency for modesty to be policed in, in groups of women, uh, for slut shaming to happen, for certain women to be ostracized because of their beauty or because they are being provocative. So that's another dimension of, of this conflict, women who are enforcing a kind of code of contact on other women and excluding women uh, who don't uh, live up to those kind of expectations. But the something that's interesting about gossip is that it's self-reported that women don't think that they're doing something bad when they gossip. They actually think they're doing something good. They're, they're giving other people in their community who they trust worthwhile information about somebody who is untrustworthy. This is seen as a virtuous behavior. It's often seen as actually contributing uh, and doing something good, even some women report feeling like they're engaging in this behavior against another woman, like that's they're doing them a favor. So there's a self-deceptive aspect of how this, how this rivalry seems to work in terms of what women report um, in the research. Obviously, social exclusion. So tinkering with somebody's uh, status seems to be the, the tool that women leverage. Uh, in order to exclude rivals from their competitive space. So excluding people or forcing a woman to just choose to leave. That's also something that's, that happens quite a bit where women who are excluded from a group, they just choose to, to leave it because it's just so difficult for them to engage. And there doesn't have to be any direct confrontation at all. Um, it's just, you realize you, you're supposed to leave and then you do. Right, so there's that, that aspect of it as well. So I'm sure you all have your own thoughts and experiences with this. I thought I would throw out some of those aspects of behavior that I noticed when I was going through the research and I was thinking about this in my own, in my own time. And if any of you feel provoked by that, I would love to hear your thoughts. We can go down whatever direction you're interested in. And uh, yeah, so I'll just, Throw that out there. See who who takes the bait. <laughs> that was a lot to absorb at once. Is there um, yeah, like a, a a specific aspect that we want to start on before moving forward? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think a good one was maybe we were kind of talking about this in the room initially. Uh, rivalry. Why don't we just respond to that word? What does rivalry mean to you all? And particularly, we can add the, the dimension of rivalry between women. Well, what comes up for me is that my, my first rivalry in life uh, was with my sisters. So female rivalry is something that um, I, I've grown up with in my home. Uh, and I know some women who, who don't have sisters or even women who have sisters and brothers might have a different experience, but uh, I'm, I'm the, the oldest of three kids in my family and we're all girls. So um, growing up, there was, there was a lot of rivalry around being the good girl. And it almost felt like this invisible, there was like an invisible crown that got passed around between the three of us, but there was also like, I don't know, like an invisible dunce cap or something that would also be going around all the time. So you were always wondering if you were like the good girl in the family or the problem child in the family. And it always felt like 
somebody was in neutral territory and somebody held the exalted and the like diminished positions in the family in our parents eyes all the time whether that was just my perception or the kids perception or if it actually had any sort of reality in terms of how how our parents were relating to us but it was something that like even even like I totally remember times when I would get the sense that oh I think this month the other kid is the problem child and there's like this big sigh of relief of not having to compete as hard for my parents love and attention um and yeah the, that we were all girls meant that was always about presenting as the right kind of feminine at the right age in the right way Hmm, that's super interesting because um, I don't have any sisters and I always wished that I did. Um, I just have one brother. Um, and when this topic's been going around my head, I, I have to say I don't really I don't really resonate with it as a, as a personal experience. Um, I have like strong female friendships are, are a really um, big cornerstone of my life, really big supportive um, aspect of my life. Um, but I'm aware of female rivalry as a, as a trope, you know, as a kind of, um, um, it comes up in myth and it comes up in film and, uh, and for sure I've experienced jealousy. So when we talk about rivalry, I, I think it most comes to mind when, when we talk about jealousy and when there is a man involved, but it's interesting that you had this with your sisters, um, and there's no man involved, um, and but it was still an element of competition for your for your parents like uh, approval so yeah interested to hear other people's experience of having sisters or yeah mm -hmm. i think i process rivalry as rivalry uh, <laughs> as primarily sexual um at least when i think of female rivalry like there's a lot of people rivalry that happens um but when I have rivalry against men, that's like a different thing. But when it's very specifically oriented around the gender, when I'm like, all right, I, there's something about the womanness in this person is like making me have the sensation. Uh, I think it comes down to, to mate selection. Like, I think a part of my brain wants to know which one of us can get the highest quality mate in this group. And there's sort of this constant subconscious evaluation of like everybody's pros and cons that like does some sort of like rough ranking to like to know kind of what I have a shot at getting like the the highest quality semen that I will be able to like capture and control which is a little ironic because I'm polyamorous but still it's like it still kind of goes um and it's hard for me to imagine female rivalry that doesn't also apply to male rivalry uh, unless it's in the context of mate selection yeah, it's it's interesting because, you know, a lot of what the research I was doing was about, you know, I don't work in an office. I've never worked in an office, but there were a lot of women who were talking about specifically like these things coming up in their office environments and uh, that there is actually an entanglement between the sexual thing that you're talking about with sexual rivalry and wanting certain kinds of, uh, let's say, opportunities from from men or jobs or uh you know being more beautiful than your boss and that causing problems for certain women i don't know if anybody has experience with working in that kind of uh, professional environment i don't i just have the you know accounts of women online uh about it but there does seem to be this weird entanglement like like this world of of evaluating yourself in relationship to other women in order for there to be mate selection and to know where you are in the ranking of, of other women around you in terms of who can get the best man ends up kind of encroaching on work dynamics um and yeah i don't i, I don't know does anybody have that uh, experience at all in in work my main experiences in kind of office classical work environments have been that I'm, you know, I'm often the only woman. So I've never really had that experience of having rivalry with other women, um, which is a whole other thing in itself. Um, and I think there can be an element of sort of like pulling the ladder up behind you after, you know, kind of competing for scarcity uh, of, of position in like male dominated work environments. Um, and I've definitely also heard other people's experiences of it. Um, but part of me wonders if it's just kind of 
I don't know whether it's anything specific to female behavior or it's just kind of un, un, um, undeveloped relational behavior um, of just kind of not really having, a, you know, um, self-awareness in, in that way. I just, yeah. Yeah, I don't have any experience in like a professional environment. I'm still just finishing up law school. But I did um, I did lead a team of women uh, in a pilot course in law school once. And we were all, you know, very pretty, very smart, very powerful people. Um, and in that context, I didn't notice so much like a sexual rivalry come up. It was almost like a rivalry around who could play this like boy game the best like mm. who can be the least feminine of the group while still like nailing femininity like because law school is kind of like even though I mean it's not as much of a boys club as it surely was in the past there's pretty like even split of men and women actually studying law where I'm from at least um but the 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 structure of the schooling is very masculine it's like all argumentative it's all um very intellectual it's not at all in the body it's not like creative in in the sense that we normally associate with femininity so there was a strange a strange sense of rivalry of like who could you know still maintain this really high level of being beautiful and like sexually powerful but not allow that to interfere with this like very masculine centered presentation of being powerful in in terms of the law school interesting okay yeah that's weird because yeah you, you have to find some ranking i guess it shifts into something else and I, maybe this goes into um the idea of like you know you were talking about this with your sisters, like the, the good one, the good girl, or like the, the deviant girl or whatever, and, and how there is the sense of like wanting to find a ranking system uh, in order to, I mean, I guess, ascend the status ladder in some way. Like if you're not organizing yourself around some system of scarcity where there's like a very small amount of something good and a, you know a lot more of something bad, and you don't really end up with the differentiation of status and you're ambitious or you're trying to move yourself forward in some way um moving towards those points of high status is kind of that's that's like the goal that's what's driving you so yeah maybe there's a, a way that this is more about rivalry in general and I'm, i guess i'm curious about like what we think is uniquely female uniquely about women i guess ayla pointed out that this seems to be around sexual rivalry uh, and then also what just seems to be a generally rivalrous uh, way of way of being both with men and with women. Um, I, I'm, I might still be a little bit on the workplace thing, but also on this thing, which is that I work in an all female environment in the sense mm -hmm. that all of my competitors are female because I do sex work. And that's a really interesting dynamic because there's no men competing on the same grounds. It's all women. Um, and typically there's, a, like any rivalry that occurs is almost always never public. It's never put forward. Um, it's never common knowledge. It's all like extremely quiet because there's a very strong pressure to not, uh, be open that you are being rivalrous. And the ranking is kind of obvious in regard, like I'm on, I do only fans and then you get like a percentage to say how much money you're making. And here, like the money is very correlated to the, all the other things that make you valuable as a mate. So we get to see, we get to see like a pretty concrete array of how valuable a woman is sexually to men, mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting. And, and um, I forgot I was going with that, <laughs> but, uh, but there's there's very careful things you can never express uh jealousy towards somebody making more money than you publicly but it does happen privately um like in i've been in various forms of sex work in the past where i wasn't doing as well and it felt like a stab to my soul uh, when like one of my very close friends was doing more and i never ever expressed to her that i was jealous or upset 
uh, even though we had like an extremely intimate relationship in every other way it was like that thing was the thing that was the we weren't allowed to talk about but i did talk about it with other girls who were part of my friend group who weren't doing as well as, as that lady uh so like all of like the lower girls that have coalesced coalesced and like had grievances um uh, that never made it up the ladder because you know the, the up the ladder is powerful like we want to please up the ladder their alliances is really valuable to us so, okay i'm done now do you think that that's part of why the secrecy is there? Like you you don't want to not receive favors or you don't want to show your weakness because you want to kind of, I guess in some way, have the opportunity to glean some status or relationship with those higher status mm -hmm. people. And so you hide your, your grievances, but you still hold them, you still have them. Yeah. Is that what you think is about? Yeah, the alliances are incredibly valuable, which I'm sure it's the same in other kinds of workplace environment to have somebody have your back or like advertise you or work with or create content with. Um, and also that that is like that person has ties into the rest of the community and those persons. So it's not just like the individual person you're working with. It's like the, the whole network, the whisper network of women uh, who are all like in touch with each other, like underground. Like if you fuck over one node, you don't know what the... Uh, like the ripple effects are going to be. So you have to be extremely careful. I wonder how that compares to other industries where there's more women than men, because it's, you know, there's only kind of a handful. Um, I wonder how it compares to like other, yeah, others. Does anyone know? I have no idea. Also, and also I wanted to ask, you know, when you're, when you have this situation where you, you felt kind of, uh, rivalry with your with uh, this other woman was it based on the fact that she was earning more money or because of the kind of perceived value from men that she was getting she was hotter she was more physically attractive and earned more money for less work and i was really angry about that even though i loved her very much yeah i think that this this seems like a kind of I don't know, ancestral environment of women in my, in my eyes. Like there's, this is kind of what I would imagine a group of women who are, let's say maybe all, all the wives of, of one patriarch or something like that would engage with, right? Because, or, I mean, when, when, when we were more segregated and women were more just directly valued for their beauty, their youth, and they're for, and those are proxies for fertility. And that if there were other women in your environment who basically got more attention, got more resources for less perceived work, right? They're just more hot. Um, that is like where a lot of this conflict comes up. And this is also what I was thinking about in terms of modesty is that it seems like modesty is something that women are enforcing on one another because they don't like the idea of another woman cheating by just exposing more of her beauty to the world that she would just very easily get more attention. And I don't know if that seems like something that <laughs> resonates with anyone, um, but that was my suspicion of, of what modesty is. It's not like there's this idea that maybe men are enforcing that or that men are enforcing um, like codes of, of chastity but when I looked into at least self-reported um, research from men today, I don't know about men in other cultures or uh, this, these are all weird studies um, meeting, uh, uh, was that men didn't really seem to care how many sexual partners a woman had and men didn't really seem to care if they were wearing lipstick to work, but it was the women, <laughs> it was the women who found that that was more threatening to them. There's still this going on in sex work. I'm, I'm going to relate all this to the sex work because that's the only thing I know. But there's still tiers of uh, superiority based on how much you're willing to show. Oh. Uh, so there's like varying levels of explicitness. You show your face. Do you do lingerie teasing? Do you show nudity? Do you do spread shots? Do you do masturbation? Do you do boy girl videos with somebody else? All right. So there's this whole tier of like how much sexually you're willing to give up. Um, and the more money you can make with giving up the less sexually, like the, the higher you're ranked in, in the status game or whatever. 
and I, I don't think it's like enforced by men really it's like sort of just the way that it is like men like hardcore porn more than they like lingerie shots it's just sort of like built in obviously like you know if we want sex like we're probably gonna like the actual sex versus you know the making out uh so it doesn't feel like a gender thing it just feels like kind of the way that intimacy works horocracy <laughs> Yeah, I do feel like some of it comes from this this thing you're bringing up, Raven, about like the the cheating idea, like, oh, you're willing to go that far. And so you get way more attention, but that's cheating. If I went that far, I'd get all the attention too, is kind of like the implicit like outrage in that. But I think that there might be also like like a, an, an outrage that moves in the other direction, like that if you're willing to go that far, it puts pressure on me and all the other women to compete on that level. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to do that either because we're not comfortable with it or we're afraid we can't compete with you at that level. And so there's like this, like, I think maybe it, it people can get this feeling of like, oh, like you're a traitor against the other women by 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 being willing to do these things and therefore like increasing the dem demand for them and then the rest of us all collectively have to deal with what you did do you think this is women or do you think it's just capitalism like yeah i mean it just it kind of it's interesting because it yeah i mean it feels um yeah, that's what came to mind when I was, was hearing you speak, because, I mean, male attention isn't really scarce. Um, you know, if it, it, the, the, the thing about being hotter, I mean, the attention for being hot is, is yeah, it's not, it's not a scarce, it's not a scarce resource. But obviously, then when you're like competing with other women for like financial resources of those men, then it does become, you know, like, you know, you throw your hat in the ring in a different kind of a way. Yeah, I, I think. Oh, sorry. Go, oh, ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just thinking that uh, even before it was literal currency, attention was pretty much literal currency. Like when when you needed to go from your father's house to your husband's house, or you're gonna go hungry, attention is money. Like it it it, it, it seems like to to the extent that women have always kind of been less independent there's always been like a, a real financial and material reason to value male attention and compete with other women for it, whether it was like literally for money or or two steps away from money. It's funny because I feel like I've spent my entire life actually like avoiding male attention. <laughs> you know, I just, I'm like, leave me alone, <laughs> always. So I actually feel like a lot of my life has been, has been that game rather than the other, the one that you just mentioned. Yeah, I wonder if this is like something about, I mean, obviously not all women are the same, right? Um, and some some women are like, I think this is why I brought up initially ambition and not to say that you aren't ambitious, right? I'm not saying that necessarily, but that was one of these traits that was so highly correlated with women engaging in this kind of exclusionary behavior um, that if they were, really kind of ruthlessly ambitious. This was just a much more, you know, active component of their behavioral dynamics. So I don't know if that could be, that could be part, or that could be a proxy for like a cluster of, of behaviors or dispositions, that there's this kind of, this world of women in a certain subset of like the larger group that is women that tend to engage in this kind of activity or behavior. But then like what maybe you were saying is that ends up having this ripple effect because we're all in this network together. And if we even just have a few women who are engaging in that way with, with the rest of us, that we're all gonna have the implications of that behavior in our, in our environment, in our community. So that could just, that could be part of the difference. Yeah, go ahead, maybe. Yeah, one, one thing I wonder, Tar Tarn, is like, do, do you have a lot of trust? You have a lot of trust in your female relationships that that like whatever bonds you have are going to like be prioritized over and withstand any like 
distribution of male attention. Because that's something that in, in, in my experience of my female friendships, um, like who's getting more male attention has like made or break broken those friendships. And so I can, I, I can kind of feel like I, I couldn't, I couldn't afford to say like, oh, go away, men. I don't need your attention. I have my girlfriends because my girlfriends, as soon as they saw all that male attention were like, she's a threat, screw her. And then I'm left with only men <laughs> or just completely being alone. Uh, so I wonder if it's like when you have these really secure female friendships, you can afford to rely less on male attention for security and, and support and things like that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I definitely do have a lot of trust in my female friendships. They've definitely kept me alive. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, I, 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 they're definitely more of a stable point in my life than, uh, yeah, than male attention. Yeah, that's interesting. Also coming back to what you were saying with your sisters. So like that early kind of situation of having that, maybe that like resonates down as well. Yeah, I can imagine that like feeling like I was in competition for my parents' love with my sisters might have like translated into this parallel of finding myself in relationships with other women who also wanted to compete for love and attention. Um, I also, I, I feel like in many ways, I remember earlier, you said that like female rivalry to you is like a trope. And um, for me, like female best friendship is something that I'm only really aware of as a trope. I, I, I've like heard of like, oh, girls stick together and like put themselves before boys. And then they like, you know, hang out together and eat ice cream when they get dumped or something and I'm like that's all that's all stuff I've seen on tv that doesn't have any like reality for me and so it's like interesting to see how like you could have like these opposite experiences of relationships with women I'm curious if anybody has had a close female friendship with anybody who has a significant gap in status with them like either higher or lower do you mean like attractiveness or or money or yeah well uh mate selection so somebody who who like if a guy were interested in you he would very very obviously be interested in her over you or vice versa or um, or have we all just been in re relatively similar tiers of friendships i'm wondering if there is pressure that the the, the kinds of friendships we do end up making are with people who we, like the rivalry is somewhat unclear who would win. Mm. I mean, yeah, I think um, it tends to, I mean, just my first feeling is, yeah, it's pretty much equal and, and um, everyone has different. I, I, it's funny because before this talk, I tweeted like this uh, gif from Mean Girls, like, I'm gonna be the one that's like, can't we all bake cookies and just be happy? And I feel like this is like playing out in real time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I feel like, everyone has their own merits, you know? So if I, if, you know, some of my best friends, like some of my best female friends have different, um, they just, they're just different from me. So I don't, I, I, if a guy's into them, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think if I've ever had an experience where we're into the same guy, um, which of course has happened, but not for a while. Um, and that's the case when this would definitely, this dynamic would definitely kick in um, for sure. I don't need to, uh, to question that. Yeah, I would say like for me, I've, first of all, I, you know, since middle school, so like pre-puberty, I haven't had a huge gaggle of girlfriends around me at all. Um, and I think it probably does have something to do with this. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, the, the, the female friends that I do have, I, they're, yeah, they're, I mean, they're, they're different obviously we're all different but um we're yeah we're kind of in the similar ranking group in terms of sexual availability um and sexual desirability and personality desirability and that's what I also noticed in when I look through the research that women tend to want to their friends tend to be within you know very similar uh, position to them sexually and um romantically in terms of their attraction to men uh, or men that's attracted to them. So that tracks, that tracks for me. I don't know maybe what your experience has been. 
I, I'm very much like you. I haven't actually had any close female friendships since grade school. Um, uh, but even then, uh, for the most part, the, the, the girls in the really close group of friends almost exclusively looked very similar, you know? same kind of like build all white girls like not not a lot of variation in the friend group at all and even with my sisters like I mean genetics will do that but we're equally kind of attractive people uh different but comparable in many many ways so I don't have a lot of experience with being friends with women who are less attractive than me other than in like very like specific context like you know my my friend from English 101 might be a girl who's less attractive to me than me that but it like that that relationship lasts for four months and then we never talk again or something like that it no lasting bonds with women who aren't in my category I often find that I just like I have like I'm really attracted uh to my female friends you know like I'm like when I meet if I meet a uh, like a woman who I really who I think wow she's really amazing really interesting I tend to like that tends to be the direction I go I'm just like wow you're so fucking hot like yes um and I don't tend like yeah that's ten that tends to be the direction I go in um yeah do you have experience with that you know I I often sometimes I mean when I was younger I would get I would feel jealous and then often I realize oh I'm not jealous I just have a crush on her like and I'm not even I wouldn't even say that I'm like I mean I'm pretty straight <laughs> as far as they go so yeah I'm I'm not straight and I do wonder if that has something to do with like struggles with female friendship because there's like blurry lines around it and then to have somebody be like attractive and threatening sexually at the same time can be confusing and um heteronormativity is out there and so it just kind of makes female relationships a whole can of worms that i don't open often i i often find almost the reverse like I, when I experience a crush on a female friend, I, I think usually it's end up is a cover for jealousy because I don't want to admit much to myself that I'm jealous because jealousy is like sort of an admission that I'm like below them in some way or that they are threatening to me. And that's so uncomfortable to me. I process it as, well, it's not that I'm just uncomfortable because I'm attracted to them because that's a very convenient story for me to tell about myself. Yeah, I've been wondering about this in terms of in terms of bisexuality, like because I wouldn't yeah, I wouldn't consider myself to be like totally straight and I've wondered about whether or not that is kind of like a hack. You know, like if you are looking at if other women are attractive to you in a sexual way, if they seem like sexual prospects and they're more attractive than you are, then you're kind of like there's this kind of like flip where suddenly there are people that you can actually engage with in this sexual way and there's a different kind of dynamic of status um and i've also read in the you know in the research or whatever that female sexuality is much more fluid than than male sexuality seems to be and i i was like well maybe that has something to do with it being a kind of regulator um of like female interaction or behavior because there's a way that you can kind of if you have a sexual interest in another woman, it sh it shifts the the rivalry in some way or another. But that's just a that's just a theory. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I love um, what Ali just said. Turning female rivalry into female sexual tension is a great strategy. And like, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes it a lot more fun. I have another question, which is um, when you guys are talking about like female rivalry in high school or whatever. I, I was raised extremely religious in like a heavily patriarchal culture where you don't date, you just marry. Uh, you, you court in public with other people and then you make an arrangement to get married and then that you can have your first kiss. Like this was sort of the environment. And I don't think there was any female rivalry. I just that word today, but, uh, and it's possible because I'm just oblivious or something. I'm not saying this is necessarily true, but I just, there, there was extremely little sense of like, I need to figure out who is more, attractive and I'm curious if like in highly conservative cultures where like uh, relationships are highly regimented is sort of like a method of reducing rivalry maybe not intentionally 
that sort of is a side effect. Um, and it's like sort of the rivalry we have now is a, a result of a lot of freedom, which worth it. I'm not saying we should become patriarchal, um, but like the fact that we have so many fluid options is now like in bumping this thing up when it didn't used to be the case quite so much. Yeah, I actually suspect that this is part of how this system emerged. It's a kind of truce. It's a kind of like, you know, we all have different interests. Like, you know, men were, many men were frozen out of, of relationships for a long time when we had polygynous societies and women had to compete with other women who were the wives of, of one specific man. Um, and the monogamy thing and the enforced monogamy through an institutional religion and enforced modesty is like kind of rearranging the social organization so that there's, a, I would say, I think following what you're saying, like less rivalry between people in these different segregated sex groups and that that possibly solves the problem like in some ways uh, for a decently long time. And we're now unraveling all of those things. And I agree with you that it's much better for us to have freedom and to be able to, ex you know, sexually express and all of that. But there did seem to be something very adaptive about that arrangement um, in terms of reducing the sense of uncertainty, because for a woman not having it, not having a sense of certainty about getting access to, to a male is like very um, terrifying. I mean, that was the way that you were going to be able to secure your future as a as an adult. And so knowing that you were going to be arranged would just like totally reduce so much anxiety, you know? Yeah, it's interesting to think of like the idea that it was gonna be like a one-to-one -one thing. You're gonna have one person and you're not gonna have to compete with anybody for that one person's attention and they're they're your person that's it you don't have to shop around like I can imagine how in a lot of ways that would reduce a lot of the tensions between women and within individual women I I, I wonder as we're talking about this too if we've kind of like moved into this liminal space that might be like peak stress on female relationships where you are still expected to eventually choose one person which puts like this weird kind of I don't know like exclusivity scarcity kind of flavor to things but at the same time you're supposed to sleep around and shop around and compete in this like other time to find that one person and so it, it I like I can imagine in the polyamorous community that because you at least don't have to choose one person and be reliant on them for your dreams come true or whatnot that's still kind of in the like romantic mythos of monogamy um you you don't have to be as uptight when other women share men with you you don't have to worry that oh no my one and only is gonna get led away by some woman and stray and i'm gonna be left alone or something like that but um i i i don't know for sure i i i'm just speculating <laughs> Um, I wanted to respond to one thing in the comments um, it's because I disagreed with it and it's more fun to disagree with things than agree with it. Um, but basically like women define themselves in relation to men and we need to move beyond it. Uh, I think that's like a kind of a romantic way of looking at things that is also like completely impossible and untrue in the sense that like in order to procreate we need men so far as far as, far as we've gotten. And, and so there's always, we cannot move beyond it. Like we are defining ourselves in contrast to like the mates that we choose and vice versa. Like I think men cannot also move beyond defining themselves in relation to like their value to women. I think that this is inherent and this is not bad. I like, I wanna be careful of shaming this kind of thing. Like it's okay to be like trying to figure out what your value is to men. And like, there's a lot of toxic things that, that can go around it, but like the core of it is, I just wanna like put a thing of like, it's fine. <laughs> Don't worry about it on top of that. Yeah, and I definitely agree that it's like a sort of, I, I don't know, um, it's, a, it's a patriarchal notion that men aren't completely equally defining themselves in terms of women. Um, even when they had a lot more social power, they were still like defining themselves based on 
on what kind of women they could get and whether or not they, you know, had, you know, 15 sons with that woman or something like that. Yeah, I mean, whether or not you had like a bunch of wives from all over the world was like a huge sign of your wealth. You know, that was a huge sign of your status as a male is like how many beautiful women <laughs> you had or you could provide for. So, um, and the approval, male, men wanting approval from women is a super powerful force. And I think something that we're becoming more acquainted with as women have been liberated to really exercise their power and particularly their sexual power. And men really, we can see it. I mean, Ren really like being in relationship to that and really feeling its power in society. And I think that's totally changing a lot of our social dynamics that women can really flex and exercise all of the sexual power and see how it, in some cases, really like puts men in, and to their knees really <laughs> not in a, like a bad way but it, it does um shift the power dynamics in society that because this this unleashing of like the female sexual being is totally changes the arrangement of, of of power and what you can use as power i think as well um that when women were enforcing each other in such a way that modesty was was a sign of your status as a woman, you know, that's reducing the capacity for you to use your sexual power in a, in a social environment. And now we're totally re rewriting the script when it comes to that. And so that power is being unleashed and exercised and we're figuring out how we can wield it um, in ways that are, you know, in our own interests. But then I think also the next question is like, how can we wield this in ways that is like, pro-social or responsible or like virtuous in some way or not mm, yeah and I, I think a lot of that power is still being located in the bodies of like you mentioned like youth earlier and I think that there is this thing about youth currency that I was thinking about in relation to this topic because um, in terms of this um, dynamic we were talking about of approval from men like proportionally women have a lot less time that they're kind of given that approval you know the window of time is is like ends quite you know if, if you say oh you turn 30 and suddenly you're like off the market or whatever and men are kind of just coming into their own and they have maybe 10 15 more years where they're considered to be kind of in their prime and I think this creates a rivalrous dynamic just because the window is so much smaller and I think there does need to be I think sexuality and like sexual attractiveness doesn't necessarily come from how from the object from being looked at it also comes from who like how you express and how you feel your sexuality and I think that um kind of ha like moving forwards to a place where women older women and women who have had children and women with different skin tones and uh, ability can like feel their sexuality and 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 I think actually like men dig it like I think men dig all sorts of their, their 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 preferences a lot much wider than like you would think based on you know a lot of, from current culture. Yeah, I think it's true that female rivalry um, can be maybe more confusing in some ways than than male rivalry because our culture has opened up so recently. And so I feel like in some ways, at least, there's still like a pretty clear defined like gender role around masculinity. They, they know what they're competing for and how to compete for it and what that should look like. Whereas uh, in, in, the, in the women's space right now, there's kind of a much broader po possibility space for how to experience sexuality and how to compete sexually and what that could look like. And so there's a lot of like confusion and figuring it out and making up your own rules going on on our end that I don't see as much going on in the male world, but I'm, I'm not, I don't know for sure. Yeah, that seems right to me just because like we, we're, we're, and of course, Ayla, I mean, you grow up literally in a fundamentalist household where like the the force of the abrahamic god was was there 
the patriarchal God. Um, but the fact that that's like this last 2000 years of our, of our social arrangement, I think it's very, very much uh, telling and, and how recently we've, we've unraveled those um, laws from, from the revelatory religions and are exploring these other possibility spaces for social arrangement. It, I mean, women, yeah, I mean, I think of a, a lot of the way the metaphor I think about is like, you know, a bottle that's been shaking up and the cap has just been taken off. And now it's just like chaotic flow of, of energy that's just coming out into the environment and hasn't quite arranged itself in a particular way so that we know what to expect or know what to have ha that we're going to have happen. And I think there's a lot of exploration going on. And that's kind of what I, you know, that's what I see in the polyamorous community is kind of tinkering and playing around with these things and being like, oh, there's this emotion that happens when this thing happens. What's going on with that? And like, how do I understand rivalry? And how can I set up more trusting relationships? And how can I push through my feelings of insecurity? And really getting into what these dynamics are in a felt sense and then how can you transcend them or not be at their at their mercy basically and i think that there is a tie between our ancestral kind of environment and i wouldn't say that this is universal necessarily but it does seem to be the case in terms of um the western tradition and the abrahamic religions um because of their patriarchal nature and just how consistent they've been in enforcing that over the last 2000 years. But coming out of that specifically um, and beginning to play around with these dynamics and deconstruct them and reimagine things seems to be part of the possibility space that people are exploring with in terms of new forms of relationship. We'll see where it goes. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Yeah, in some ways I feel almost like less than qualified on the topic because uh, like I said, like when I was in high school was the last time I had really close female friendships and those female friendships did like traumatically end over like sexual rivalry with men. Like we all hit puberty and it all exploded and I was like, I am never doing that again. Um, and, and so I feel like I, I, I like have kind of opted out of female rivalry by just being like, I don't like women. I'm not going to interact with women in an intimate way. I got hurt once and, and, you know, uh, once bitten like a hundred billion times shy. Uh, I, I've just like really not interacted with other women outside of the polyamorous context. Like mm. I'm, I'm cool with my metamors. And that's, that's pretty much where I draw the line. Like, unless you are like really investing in somebody else that I also love, then I am not going to do the work of overcoming this like emotional barrier that I have to, to the gender play. I'm curious about uh, the dynamic we're in right now in this call. I'm wondering because uh, like Benito was asking earlier about like how do you handle this in your personal lives um do you bring it up when it's occurring and my question is are we in a rivalry right now in this panel do you feel that at all great question mm, I mean I don't feel like super comfortable but then there's also like 37 people in this room and I'm speaking in front of them all so I probably wouldn't feel, ever feel comfortable in that situation but I mean, in terms of like relating to you, I mean, I don't really know you. I'm actually thinking like, oh, I would love, you know, you say you haven't had female friends. I'm like, well, let's be friends, <laughs> which is so lame. And then I'm like, oh, but um, I mean, I do find that a bit sad. I have to be honest with you to, to not experience that, that sense of female solidarity. Um, and I've definitely been friends with, um, like I've had, many interactions with women where I've heard this story before. This is by no means like a, like a new thing for me to hear. Um, but I, I do think um, it's by no means like a, a personal, uh, like um, I don't think it's anything wrong with the person, but I think it, maybe it says something about, yeah, I mean, 
like what is going on maybe it's something to do with school dynamics maybe it's culturally as well because you know we're from different sides of the Atlantic it's not that much different culturally but you know there's many possible dynamics going on there but that wasn't really answering your question so I'll leave the floor open to the rest of you and that was part of my idea with bringing us all together was I was like if I mean we're like all around the same age we're all intelligent and beautiful and we're talking about female rivalry <laughs> so I was like hoping we would wind uh to this place and uh I, I thought maybe it'd be interesting to think about you know whether or not there was any dynamics that were arising here and yeah go ahead time well what's interesting is like there's this um going on in the comments which I've like half been aware of is this thing of like oh do we they even need men like kind of getting a little bit horny you know like watching this um which is like very much something that I anticipated happening. <laughs> and I kind of like had this sort of like, yeah, okay, uh, um, sense coming on this show. I was like, yeah, okay, we can play up for the boys. Like, my, I'd probably much rather have this conversation with you guys personally, but also, you know, of course there's something fun about playing up for the boys as well. Like, you know, that's enjoyable, but it's quite interesting because it's sort of actually been playing out in real time. Yeah, I personally found it pretty impossible to go into a panel of women talking about female rivalry and not run the calculations in my head. Um, and it wasn't so much about like, I have to compete with women because obviously like the whole subtext is that women are competing. It What, what came up more for me is I was like, I have to compete the exact right amount. <laughs> I, I can't compete too much that would be obvious we've got to be subtle we have to compete the right amount in the right ways for the right things and to what end i'm not i'm not sure but the calculations happened in my head for sure i noticed that all of you seem like, like roughly within what i consider like like the tier of people that i could be friends with because i was asking earlier like are you friends with anybody like supermodels or like really you know people you feel bad about and I'm like okay no like I feel like and I did this I noticed this is totally subconsciously I realized afterwards is that I checked to see if my male friends would want to bang you guys I was like imagining like uh, all the men I know be like would they would they try and like make passes at them and I was like yeah I was like, okay cool <laughs> it's so weird like that's 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 the thing that I was doing I also wonder if like the female rivalry thing is like it becomes obvious that we're competing for like or at least in my view that we're like trying to figure out who could like get the, the, the best mate or something and so for the the people enjoying this in the audience like like it's clear that the dynamic is like we want a good male dick or something and then that that makes them they like it. I mean you're not wrong. I, I like a good male dick for sure. I'm not going to deny that. But I'm also curious, like, like, did you notice any sort of like little checks that you were running in your heads uh, to, to, to like suss out the rest of the women on this panel? I definitely find that um, I probably have like preconceived notions about our relative status. And I imagine that that has everything to do with mate selection for sure. Um, I I also might feel a little bit of that. Uh, I think you mentioned something before about like, no matter how you actually feel, you have to play nice because we're all in the network together and you need these alliances and you need these relationships. So uh, there, there wouldn't be like, I, I, I think if I felt jealous of any of you here, it wouldn't show up in my brain as jealousy right now because I like before coming in had this like understanding in myself that like that would not be a safe or useful way to feel about this interaction. So even if it happens, it's not going to come up like that in my awareness. That's the yeah, that's the just self deception thing kind of going on. So what is it? Deceive yourself better to deceive others. Uh, <laughs> it can't be detected um yeah I mean like I feel like before doing this I wanted you know I wanted to like make sure everyone had a good time and was felt you know impressed by the premise you know so I could like 
feel good about myself or whatever. Um, I think also, you know, like both, you know, maybe you've been around the STOA, but you know, now I'm realizing why maybe we haven't become friends. <laughs> um, it's we, both, we both have these rivalrous things going on. And then of course, ALA, you know, we kind of know each other through like other people and you know, I watch you in the periphery and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think for me, a lot of it has to do with, uh, intelligence. And that's another aspect of, of, uh, like it, I, I, intelligence is kind of like fetishized almost in, in the culture. And so like other smart women in particular for me, like, like whether or not someone's more beautiful than I am is not as operative in terms of feeling threatened as someone who is beautiful and intelligent like that combination to me is much more of like cortisol running through the body or whatever it is and um you know so it, there's this kind of tension and I think maybe you really put a really describe this well of like wanting to compete but not wanting to compete too much wanting to make friends but also wanting to like flex a little bit you know and have both of those dynamics going on simultaneously as you're talking, I, I noticed that I had been talking sort of like in terms of physical whatever, like banging or something. But then I realized more accurately it would be dating. Like, I think I'm less threatened by somebody wanting to bang somebody, but if they want to date them, that feels like a way more significant thing. Like, yeah. And so, so you're right that the intelligence absolutely feeds into it. And then, then it becomes so much more about physical attractiveness. Like, I think it's like you have to pass some sort of standard in order to be considered. But once you have, like, everything else becomes very important. So, yeah, totally right on that. Yeah, I definitely have thoughts come up, too, about, like, I, I'm in a long-term relationship. I wonder if I was single, if it would, like, be amplified a lot to, to feel like I'm competing. Um, and I do also relate a lot to what you said, Ayala, about like sex is not actually the most threatening thing compared to the dating, like it, especially in the in a polyamorous context, I don't really even check in with who my boyfriend is. Well, I mean, lately with the pandemic and all, no one's allowed to really do stuff. But in, in the before times, I, I didn't even need to know about that. But if you want to date someone, if you want to go study with someone, it's like I have to like know what they're about and like them and trust them and all it just the standard is way higher for who my partner can be in like a steady relationship with but if they're just having sex it's like nothing it doesn't it doesn't even like phase me it doesn't it doesn't it, that doesn't threaten me at all that that doesn't really mean a lot to me yeah that tracks too with the uh women wanting investment more than just wanting you know, kind of cheap attention. It's like, that's the really the, the, the thrust of these relationships is you want someone to say like, yeah, I'm gonna give you high trust. We're gonna be in this bond for a long period of time. Uh, and it, it's interesting that, yeah, Tarn feels this sense of really strong, stable female bond. Um, and that that seems to be some maybe clustered with her feeling of security around women and um, that also being within a group and that dynamic being kind of maybe a insulation against insecurity around relationships with men. And, you know, I don't have that same dynamic in my life um, where I'm like mostly surrounded by male, male friendships and have like one female friendship that seems to make it through. And um, the, the dynamics are, seem to be different and trust seems to be at the core of this, whether or not you feel insecure or threatened, trust seems to be the, the real thing at the at the core of all of this. Tarn, yeah, do you want to respond? Or, okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I definitely just agree that trust factors into how much rivalry affects you. I'm definitely like anxious, avoidant, attachment style kind of person. So when there's a rivalry, it's like that becomes priority one is to respond to the rivalrous dynamic that's being presented to me. I, I do imagine that people who have secure attachment um, just are way less driven by the rivalrous dynamics. Well, it's interesting because I'm also in a, mon a monogamous relationship and like uh, I, uh, I anticipate obviously this conversation of uh, open polyamory coming up and you know in Berlin it's you know it's, most of my friends are also in open polyamorous relationships and, it, and monogamy was just a decision 
that I slash we made mostly just because I don't really have time to have rivalrous dynamics with women. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I have other things I want to focus on that have nothing to do with sexual politics. Um, and I, I like the, I like having that trust, that, that stable in a like trust one-on-one -on -one dynamic with someone else. Um, but then it does make it easier because, you know, because then you kind of know it, everything's like, you know, I think you were talking about it earlier, Raven, like everything's kind of in this more traditional setup. You have, you know, everyone knows like that's your man. And then like your friend has their man. And like, there's not this kind of um, uh, this crossover. And I think um, I can definitely see the, the, the appeal in, in wanting to play around with those boundaries, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think it, it does kind of, it kind of, yeah, makes it easier. Cool. I'm gonna tag in Peter and we can go into Q and A. All right, that was fun. Um, <laughs> so let there be light in the stoa. Everyone can turn on their camera now. Uh, we're gonna be here for at least 20 minutes. Um, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat. I'll call on you and meet yourself. Uh, Benita Roy, I know you have to leave soon. Can I take you in for a question statement that you had? Uh, which one? <laughs> Whatever one feels most alive. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm curious, I guess, uh, speak directly to Raven. I've been <laughs> sending her little chats. So, you know, I remember when, um, okay, so first of all, that I, I, I think I understand what you're communicating here, and I think I understand uh, the situations of you feeling rivalrous, so I, I don't want to discount that. But what was interesting was when we first met and we did those three little uh, insight things, I didn't get like, like the way I witnessed you is like, uh, it was a cool little group, especially like after the first one and people would like a little bit show off to each other. Like I, I witnessed you like showing off to the boys and basically shining. <laughs> it was a really good, you know, it started to be a really good insight group, but I was wondering if um, so this is the way I wrote it to you. It's like you said, if the women were intelligent and beautiful, you had particularly difficulty with them. So I was wondering if you felt rivalrous with me or if I wasn't intelligent or beautiful <laughs> enough, or maybe just because I'm old. So that was I, my question. Yeah, great, great <laughs> question, Benita. Uh, good place to start. <laughs> Um, I mean, it could be whatever the answer is, is the answer. <laughs> well, I think, you know, for me, and, and you asked me this earlier, you really sniffed this out. Um, you sent me this private message asking me about my relationship with my mom and whether or not it was real rivalrous and if we were competing for attention with my dad. And that was like definitely, definitely going on. My mom and I were very competitive with one another. Um, and just, you know, so I, but my, my mom died when I was 19. Mm. And so I obviously lost this like major kind of force of both a lot of tension, but also a lot of like life and. Um, yeah, you probably lost the ability to resolve it as a, a, an adult, right? So it gets stuck in, in a, in a immature pattern that's, you're not old enough to see the, oh, the whole, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I was 19, so I was like still so much in this world of, of conflict and, you know, wanting yeah. to define my identity. And of course, I also am very similar to my mother, which is another thing that drives rivalry. The more similar you are, <laughs> the more you're going to like really hate this person. Um, and, you know, I think when we when we met or the actually the moment I learned about you in the in this world, I was like, so enamored immediately. And I think a lot of that had to do with this like surrogate mother feeling because especially since the last like year and a half or so, I processed a lot more of this grief. So I actually feel the absence of my mother rather than kind of suppressing this sense of loss. And I'm very much um, attracted to, to older women who are also are dynamic and intelligent and creative because that's exactly the way that my mom was. And you even have a similar haircut and you even kind of look similar. Like there's so many things about 
um, my like synergy with you that was very yeah. much a kind of play of my relationship with my mom. Yeah. So I think that's part of, and I also, I wanted to impress you, of course, because- Yeah, yeah, my, that's what I was saying. Like there was that funness going on. In effect, the whole, the whole group had that, but I didn't feel, it didn't have that toxic, I mean, I know what that, I know what that smells like sometimes, you know, and it didn't have that for me. So I didn't know how much, how much of it felt rivalrous to you, you know. No, it didn't feel rivalrous. And that might be a testament to the fact that I've actually processed some of this stuff. And yeah, yeah. Gone through it. Yeah. The energy there, the energy to shine or to, you know, show off. The whole group was playing off of that energy, but it didn't, didn't have, yeah, didn't have that taste to me. So. Oh, thank you for answering. Great, thanks for the question. I gotta run, so um, I just have to really do my chores now. But it was a great, you know, millions of questions, and thanks to people for looping me in. Yeah. All right, thanks, thanks, B. Um, we'll take in uh, Hannah for the next question. I hope you can hear and see me okay. My camera seems to be kind of slow. Um, so I want to talk about how like a lot of what's been in this conversation so far uh, feels really within the roles of straight world. And what I'm interested in is how this plays in gay world. And uh, I think of female rivalry, my nickname for it since I saw this session come up is uh, lesbian death spiral which Peter said is a great band name. So please someone to make that and run with it. Um, because there's this thing that seems to be really common where uh, women who are interested in each other are too, um, like too intimidated by each other to actually connect. And I think that's like, why is that such a big part of lesbian culture? or at least the aspects of it that I've experienced. That's what's interesting to me here. I wish I could speak more on that, um, but I don't have that like participation in the, in the community to really say what the dynamics of lesbian um, rivalry would look like. I've mostly gotten stuck on the first step that Hubris brought up, which is being too intimidated by women to approach them sexually. <laughs> um, so uh, I can let you know when I get over that and maybe we can have a chat. <laughs> um, but maybe other people on the panel have more insight into that. I just, um, yeah, I get stuck on the first, on the first step of this women being is just totally intimidating and not knowing how to engage in that kind of creating a froze like a stalemate basically um and yeah. stops yeah. interactions from happening yeah i'm i'm not like in the gay community or whatever but i've dated some women and you know slept with a lot and for, for me the thing i noticed was that there wasn't a playbook on how to do it like with the male thing, I knew from an early age, I knew what the roles were. I knew like what men wanted. And I knew like what I was supposed to do in response to that. I knew how to like interpret the thing that they said, you know, as maybe being interested or not. Like it, it was very, I felt very comfortable with that. And with women, suddenly it was like, I had no idea. Like she would say a thing, I'd be like, I, I've, I have not been taught in any way, not been shown any examples of what this is supposed to look like. Like, so like neither of us really were up operating on the shared knowledge of a script. We had no script, scriptless. And so that became like much more terrifying. And I'm sure women might be intimidating for a lot of reasons. Um, but for me, the intimidation came specifically from like knowing that there are like a way more ways to do the wrong thing or to miscommunicate. And so it became like much more stressful. Yeah, um, I, I'm bisexual, so I don't find it easy to talk about lesbian dynamics. I think that there's like a some really key differences that make me feel like I don't know what it's like to be a lesbian at all. Um, but in terms of my like, you know, experiences with other women, I do find that um, 
the, most of my experiences with other women have been in a polyamorous dynamic where men are also involved. And I find that the male presence is very grounding in exactly the way that Ayala has been talking about. Is like, as soon as a man is around, there's a script. We can be a team that are working together to impress the man. And we know what that would look like. And as soon as the man leaves the room, the relationship becomes kind of squishy and complicated and I don't know what to do anymore. And so I need him to come back so that I know how to relate to this woman. Um, and, and then in the, in the, very few times that I've adventured into just like solo relationships with another girl I find that a lot of the times it feels like just way too much work like um even without the scriptless part of the dynamic um men do all of the work for me I am treated like a prize. I'm treated like the thing that has to be earned and they will do all of the work and they will give all of the attention and make all of the decisions. And when that is so readily available everywhere for my sexual satisfaction to choose to put that kind of work into getting another girl's attention, oh, she would have to be way out of my league and I'd be too intimidated to do it. So it just like, almost never happens and like the handful of times I've tried it's been a you know eight coffee date disaster where I just fail spectacularly <laughs> and give up so that's my experience Tarn did you want to yeah, it's interesting because it's interesting that you define yourself as bi because I define myself as straight earlier, but I have similar experiences with women that you describe. Um, but I but I somehow identify as straight because that's who I choose, men who, who I typically I choose to be in relationships with. So I just thought that was interesting. Maybe I should identify as bi now. <laughs> All right, uh, next question, we're gonna go with our expert of the shadow here at the STOA, Aaron. Aaron, you're up. Hey guys, excuse me. Hey ladies, this has been awesome. Um, my question, maybe it's a bit of a, it's a bit off topic, but um, how does male versus female rivalry play out? Um, women are entering a traditionally male dominant hierarchy more often, and that seems to kind of short circuit the male mind. For example, if you insert a female into an all male soccer game, the men kind of become unsure of how to play. They're not sure how aggressive they should be. They might stop playing altogether. Um, do you think a man can be rivalrous with a female while still thinking of her as a female? Or does he have to, in some sense, objectify her or pretend that she's another man in order to become authentically rivalrous? Might yeah. Be no, interestingly, rivalry with men. I think men find it really hard when they can't play. I, I, I relate more to the feeling of rivalry with men than I do with women. Um, and I think men find it really hard to place you when they feel like that you have this rivalrous dynamic with them, but they're also finding you attractive. Like it really freaks them out in my experience. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it can often come on the basis of intelligence as like we mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, it, but not attractiveness. Yeah, so it's interesting. It's interesting that I have just kind of like identified that. I, I find myself trying to find an analogy so I can think about this more clearly. So I'm trying to think of like a time where um, me and a lot of people have us operating under certain rules and another set of people operating under different rules, which might be something like, um, like competing startups looking for investment. And so you would have like the startup people and then like the investors. Um, and then the question would be like, do we ever compete against each other? And there could be times where that's the case. Maybe we like me and an investor go to a party and we're like trying to impress everybody. But at the same time, I know that there's like something going on between us. And so I, I don't know if this like helps at all, but I noticed that, that this is what I'm trying to like think through to kind of figure out the question. Um, I would be afraid. I feel like I would be very confused because there would be a confusion of incentives. I think this is a really good question. Um, obviously, I think I can only speculate. 
uh, about this. My personal experience with men has not been super rivalrous. Like, it's not like I've been competing for the same job with men that I already knew. And there was a sense of, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to outdo him and maybe some tension there. So I, I don't, that seems like a something in the work environment, like where that would really become super important. And you spoke to this, like this is kind of an issue of women integrating into um, male hierarchies. And what I do sense though, is that men do want to treat women differently. You know, they want to treat them much nicer than they would treat other men most of the time. Um, and so that giving that driving, like kind of uh, almost antisocial behavior towards a woman probably feels uncomfortable. Um, and I would imagine that in the, in the male experience, there is a need to kind of have a hack of some kind to adapt to that situation to let's say, imagine the, the woman as a man would make that a little bit easier uh, to uh, you know objectify her in some way or another, or to to change what it means to be a woman. You know what is it? Wh what does that mean to a man? Like if being kind to a woman is like the way in which he codes that behavior and that relationship, then um, it would be very confusing to be in a soccer game with a woman and be like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to hurt you. You know, I don't want to kick you. How do I? How do I do this? can't really bring the full force of your of your um, aggression to that arena but maybe if you change the what category woman implies what kind of behavior that um, means and then you can start to tinker with your own perception of who a woman competitor is and maybe that is somewhat like a vilification you know, maybe maybe that could happen. Maybe that's kind of the shadow side of that. Um, a woman can become a rival and a villain, and then you're totally fine bringing out all of the more antisocial behaviors uh, to to take her down and to win in a competition with her. So that would be maybe my speculation, but I'm not a man, so I'm not sure exactly what they're having to do in their heads to adapt to this situation. Yeah, I feel mostly the same way. I don't know uh, if if the these two dynamics can get separated fully in in any context. Uh, thinking about even when I have played um, competitive games or sports with men, I've found it really attractive when they didn't like play nice with me. Um, so it feels like even when they don't treat me differently to compete sexually, that seems like a sexually competitive move on my end. That's how it lands with me. I don't know if, if that's how they feel. Um, I, I feel like the, the context in which I've experienced the like cleanest competition from men is definitely law school. But I think it's because law school is very structured and very exhausting. So you, you don't have a lot of extra energy to spend on the sexual politics because the curve is mean and that's what's going to pay your bills at the end of the degree and get you out of student loan and stuff so the the competition for the actual legal you know recognition is is what gets put first there um but even there i don't i don't at all know if that obliterates the sexual competition or just kind of puts it on the back burner. Um, I, I imagine the latter is probably the case. All right, uh, let's try to sneak in one more question. Anyone have a hard stop at the bottom of the, the hour? Can we sneak in one more? All right, uh, Ellie, you're up next. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you ladies for the discussion, very interesting. Um, I have a question, I think that Raven and maybe and I'm not sure if you Ella, spoke to that directly, but you said that you don't have many female friendships. Um, I'm curious, what is it, wh why is that? Um, and also how is it that you decided to do this uh, panel on fa female rivalry? I'm curious to know, is this, do you think this is just because generally you don't vibe that much with women? 
is it precisely because you feel that rivalry that you rather not deal with it? Maybe you feel insecure about these women. And how is it like with the women that you that you feel more rivalry with? I assume these are women that are more similar to you. So you have like more to compete with. Does that make you, at least in my case, I also feel the rivalry at the beginning, but that makes me want to be friends even more because I assume there's more in common and there's more ground for yeah for connection in that way um how can you can you speak a bit more to that um yeah yeah I mean I think the story that I've told myself about this is that I don't have as much in common with with let's say a, the average woman um like I'm very argumentative very very in my head all the time very like in abstraction um i think of myself as especially when i was younger like really coding myself as as masculine um and i had a much more masculine appearance i was really like embracing masculinity as my expression and my sense of identity and that made me you know more interested in the things that uh, i thought that men were also doing and uh, so, you know, like interest in talking about like warfare and think, you know, things like that, that to me seemed like coded male. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think I tend to not be very validating as, as, a, as a person. Um, so, you know, I've, this has come up with even one of my, my one really close female friendship, this comes up where, you know, we'll, she'll be like talking and um, and it seems like it's, there's an emotional thing going on and I should be, you know, attending to the emotional thing. And instead I'm like, well, <laughs> are you sure you believe that? Or like, what, <laughs> you know, I'm like, not very, um, kind of like soft and, and kind in some ways. And I think that that also has made me, um, someone that maybe other women keep at a distance because I'm not this, not, don't fit into the script of what, um, you know, what female care looks like. And that's, I mean, that's something that's come up in, in my, in my friendships. Um, but I've worked on it just to let everyone know I've worked on it. <laughs> I'm doing better now, but, um, yeah. And then, and then the, the woman I do have, who's like my best friend, we're, we're very similar and we're both very competitive and we both like argue a lot and we both talk about ideas a lot. And there's a lot of like performance of, of conflict and in our intellectual spheres because we're both interested in in debate and um kind of the butting of heads and the abutting of ideas so i think that that's also something that uh we're friends because we're similar in this way and we both also mostly have relationships with men so we just happen to to share a lot of these characteristics and that's what makes us compatible friends, we can understand each other's experiences and also can interact with each other in a way that we don't necessarily feel comfortable interacting with um, other other women in that way. So that's my experience. Anybody else on the panel would like to go? No, I'm sorry. I got distracted and then I and then I missed what was said. So I'm sorry. Um, personally, I think that a, a big player in it is that uh, I I really felt the sting of being rejected for being a sexual threat, and so uh, I think that sounds maybe super egoic or something like I'm super full of myself like oh I can't be friends with women because I am so pretty and they're going to be threatened and I just never want to go through that again but it is it is legitimately how I feel <laughs> Tarn? um no I was just thinking yeah I, I also um have had experiences of yeah felt the sting of of um jealousy um but i just i've just kind of cur curated my 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 friends in a way that i just i just don't vibe with women like that um but yeah i mean 
I can uh, I can definitely sympathize and empathize with that with that feeling. All right. Uh, so we have a lot of great questions that we didn't get to, but we have to close out now. Uh, but before I make closing announcements, maybe just a quick round uh, to, uh, for the panel. Uh, any closing thoughts, anything that came alive or anything you'd like to leave us with? I'm really thankful that everybody came out. I thought this was really fun and engaging. Um, I was a little intimidated by the, the fact that we'd be talking for an hour and it just went by so fast. Um, and I, I look forward to kind of chewing on some of the things that came up and I thought it was a worthwhile experiment and it was really fun. So maybe we could talk more about rivalry in the future and <laughs> some other context. I really enjoyed talking about rivalry with, with the people, like about, about the people I'm rivalrous with or something, like talking about it with, with you guys on the panel. It felt like <laughs> really fascinating. Um, and I, I don't get that a lot on stuff like this. So very fun. Definitely juicy, loved it. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, this, this is a part of my life that I don't like to talk about. And I thought that that might come up more. Like I would feel like I would just mm, no, uh, and, and kind of not offer as much a, of of what I've been through and what the way that I see things as I was able to. So I'm pleasantly surprised by that. And I'm also really grateful that the, the subject of rivalry between the four of us came up because um, it, it, it was something that was like prominent in the subtext for me and it did come through my mind and it feels like uh, it, it would be a disservice to all of us and to the audience if it hadn't come up. So thanks Ayla for that. Yeah, I was, that was going to be my question to uh, the rivaler in the room. And then uh, Ayla answered it. She didn't, she didn't hold back today, which was awesome. And then just sunk. You just felt it when that question came uh, and the energy was here. So yeah, great, great, uh, great uh, session today. Thanks to the panel for coming. Special thanks for Raven for uh, organizing this. Um, and uh, we're looking forward for more of these uh, talks. So uh, Upcoming events, we have another Dialogos, Stealing the Culture with Dialogos uh, next week, and Evan is going to be the, the Dialogos lead. Evan, can I take you in to, to plug that? Yeah, so um, we're going to have a session with a similar format next week on the 22nd surrounding the topic of awakening um, or enlightenment or however you want to uh, language that. So another juicy and highly controversial topic. The participants will be myself. Frank Yang, Michael Taft, and Daniel Ingram. So it should be uh, hopefully an interesting conversation and we'll get to explore some of the darker corners surrounding that controversial topic. So I hope to see anyone who's interested there. And uh, tomorrow, uh, Raven, you're back with another uh, hyperstition uh, uh, film watching party. Do you wanna plug that briefly? Yeah, sure. We're gonna we're gonna watch a new film that came out, uh, Hyperstition. I haven't seen it yet, so it's gonna be new for me too. But um, Hyperstition is a concept that's like kind of the accelerationist world. Um, it's about the fictions becoming real, and uh, that's obviously something that we're kind of seeing in our environment. And as a question about human nature in general, like our myths creating our realities and our realities creating our myths. So we'll be seeing what that. Uh, movie uh, provokes and lead a, another discussion about that uh, subject matter and how it applies to our world today. So hopefully we'll see you there. Beautiful. So uh, you can check out those events at the stoa.ca. Some of them are Patreon only like this one was. So thank you everyone who is supporting uh, the stoa uh, via Patreon. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming to the stoa today.